You're listening to the Archaeology Podcast Network. You are now entering the Pseudo Archaeology Podcast, a show that uncovers what's fact, what's fake, and what's fun in the crazy world of pseudo archaeology. Hello and welcome to the Pseudo Archaeology Podcast, episode 113. I am your host, Dr. Andrew Kinkella, and tonight we will explore the number one most famous tepe of all time. The best of all possible tepes, Gobekli Tepe. Okay, so here we are going to do an exploration of Gobekli Tepe. But before we do that, I have to do something, my friends. I got to talk yet again about my mail because I got a new one this week. Just came in like two days ago. And well, it was a long, very involved email that had its ups and downs and twists and turns and Ultimately, its central theme was about how bad I suck. Now, this listener hated me so badly that he decided to unfollow the entire network. Now, I'm not just talking my little humble podcast, the Pseudo Archaeology Podcast. Oh, no, no, no. I am part of the Archaeological Podcast Network, right? And he had in his feed the entire network. And he hated me so bad that he has informed us that he is going to unfollow the entire network just because of my show. Now, I'm pretty sure that he has yet to figure out that, well, you can follow one show at a time. And I would gingerly recommend to follow all the shows except mine. But uh, as he has unfollowed this network, I'm guessing he'll never hear this. In fact, as he talked about my show, allow me to quote that he, quote, cannot just follow one show, just one show. The world needs less Kinkella and his arrogant, short-sighted, close-minded, Dogmatic rhetoric. Man, that sounds pretty negative. I do see earlier in his very long, drawn out explanation of truly how bad of a person I am that I remind him of the old guard Victorian elites. Now, I don't really see that comparison, but just for him. I believe I will talk about this for a moment as a Victorian elite. And I must say, as I look at this, I remember that my last show, well, it was on ancient lizard people. Ancient lizard people it was. And that's the one that he decided to say that I was arrogant. And in fact, I was because lizard people, well, There is no such thing, and I said it in that way. Short-sighted, I am here to tell you that I do not need long sight, my friend. Short-sighted is good enough sight to know that there are no such thing as lizard people. I am close-minded on that. Yes, indeed, I am dogmatic, and my rhetoric is pure and clean. Because you know what, my friends? There is no such thing as goddamn lizard people. Too much? I know. But you're really going to send this after the Lizard People episode? That's the one where you want to hear the other side? The the pro-Lizard People side? But you know what's funny? Timing is a crazy thing. Because that same night that I got this email from this listener, and actually it ended off comparing me to Donald Trump as well. And, you know, I, I guess I'm too close-minded to see that one too. But that same night, 
I got an email from an old student of mine, a student who I think I had maybe seven years ago or so. And she emailed me and talked about how much she liked the show and how much it reminded her of like class and just kind of good times in life, you know? And I forget that sometimes that a show like this can really deliver just some basic enjoyment to people, you know? And if I've done that, that is the precise and exact thing that I want to do for you guys. You know, I just, I want us to have a little fun in the darkness. You know what I mean? And I hope this does lift people up like that, you know? And she ended by saying, quote, thank you for being awesome. And I'm telling you, man, it chokes me up. It's so nice. So when I get emails like the first one I talked about, all I have to do is think about emails like the second one I talked about. And hey, man, the first one just goes away in a puff of smoke. So go Beckley Tepe. <laughs> What is this Gobekli Tepe place that we've heard so much about? And this is a funny one because you hear this one come up a lot and it has such the sort of unique name, Gobekli Tepe, that you remember it. It kind of sticks in, but you don't quite know what it is. You just, you know, what have we heard? Either, I mean, some of us, maybe we're only hearing this for the first time. Or maybe you've heard that there's like this place and it sort of conjures in your mind an image of like an old archaeology site. And it's it's in the Near East, right? It's in, it's in Turkey, actually. But you, you think of it as this site in the desert and it has big stone pillars that are carved. You know, that's that might be the image in your brain. And the third thing might be that it's some mysterious site, right? That it that it doesn't fit. Uh, with what modern archaeology says, right? You 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 hear that a lot tied with this thing. Like somehow something about Gobekli Tepe disproves modern archaeology, right? It has key information there that that sort of archaeologists don't want you to know because it it ruins our our overall thesis on how the ancient world works. And I don't fault you for hearing any of those things. I, I first heard about Gobekli Tepe, I want to say, oh, between 15 and 20 years ago. And it was interesting because it was a site that you just never heard of at all. And then it made like a big splash in the news, you know, ooh, Gobekli Tepe found. And it was this idea that it was really, really old and for its age, really advanced in certain ways. So what are the facts there, right? What 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 is the background to this? So the setup is first, just so we we know the word Tepe means hill. So there are other sites with that last word Tepe in it. And in fact, I think it's a it's a version of the word tell, which is something you hear about in archaeology a lot. The word tell comes in, especially when you're dealing with old world archaeology like this. A tell is a human constructed mound that is there just because there have been maybe a village or this kind of thing that has been built there again and again and again over thousands of years. So you have a natural mound start to build up as foundations are made and structures are made and then they fall down and you build new ones on it. And when that happens over thousands of years, you get this level that starts to get higher. So when you see places like this, they are built on sort of a fake mountain or fake hill, I should say, that's more correct with the structures on top. It's just because, hey, man, a good place for settlement tends to remain a good place over thousands of years. So people will tend to build in the same spot. So how old is Gobekli Tepe? Well, the, it dates to eh, between about 9,500 and 8,000 BC. So this is a 10,000 plus year old site. That's that's old. You know, that's that's pretty awesome. That's that's great. And what it is, it's it's a collection of kind of. I'd say circular enclosures, 
And I believe there's six of them. Don't quote me on that. But you think of these sort of circular enclosures. Again, the tops are, are long off, so you can sort of see them. They're open to the air. These circular enclosures with, with central pillars, these central stone pillars. And those stone pillars are quite large. I want to say they're like 15 feet tall or in that vicinity. And they're T-shaped, like capital T-shaped. So they're straight, and then they have kind of a cross beam across them. But, of course, all made out of stone. And these stone pillars, or we can also call them megaliths. That word megalith is used a lot in archaeology. Megalith just means big stone. A place like Stonehenge is also a megalithic structure. And as we'll see, Stonehenge has some very, very basic similarities to this site, although it's very different in time. Stonehenge is like four and a half thousand years old. This is like 10,000 years old. So it's, it's very different in terms of time and place. But some of the generalities are similar. And the stone pillars themselves are carved, right? They're decorated with what we would call anthropomorphic. Eh, sorry, <laughs> anthropomorphic. It's anthropomorphic. Anthropomorphic figures. Anthropomorphic means humanish. The word anthro means human, right? Like in anthropology. So these anthropomorphic figures are things like you'll see, like vultures, and scorpions, and, and and things like this, like. Really, really cool, interesting creatures with a with a humanish tinge to them. And this is, again, in sort of this dry, sparse landscape. Often Gobekli Tepe will be called the first monumental architecture, right? Version 1.0, the earliest one that we have so far found in terms of when human beings actually did this, right? When they came together for the first time and made something like this. So in terms of its importance in human history, it's huge, right? And just the place itself, really interesting. So you, you envision in your mind on sort of a low rise, like a little low hill, there's like these six circular enclosures with central stone pillars in them, all kind of generally together, kind of mushed together on top of this hill or this tepe or this tell, right? So this is an important place in that 10,000 year ago world. Now, that seems pretty straightforward. Oh, okay. It's a central location. Maybe it was used for ritual. The archaeologist classic go-to when you're a bit unsure. Ah, ritual structure. But what makes it a little odd at first glance is that it's a structure made of these big stones that are going to weigh, you know, several tons each. But it's made during a time when hunter gatherers are thought to have still really kind of ruled the world right before this idea of complex civilizations, this sort of thing. So at first glance, it just seems to not make sense. Right. What? There's a complex structure there in a time of hunter gatherers. No, no, no. Such a thing could not happen. Right. But of course, it can happen and did happen. Now, how did this happen? Well, tune back in after the break and find out. Hello and welcome back to the Pseudo Archaeology Podcast, episode 113. And we've been talking about Gobekli Tepe, a famous site in the Near East in modern day Turkey. Now, how can we understand this this place that on the surface doesn't seem to make sense because it's a hunter gatherer site, but they're making big structures, right? How does this organization happen if you only have very lightly organized hunter gatherers? Well, to understand that we want to have a feeling for the Neolithic. Now, the Neolithic is the time period from which this is from. Neolithic means new stone. Neo means new. Lithic means stone, right? And this is part of the very old way, but we still use it in terms of how we divide up what you could call the Stone Age, right? As opposed to the Bronze Age and Iron Age. Again, this stuff is only for the old world. If you're talking about Europe or the Middle East or Africa, right? In those areas, you can you can use this. this. This doesn't work at all for the new world. So when we talk about 
the various stages. We have the Paleolithic, the Mesolithic, and the Neolithic. So the Paleolithic is the old Stone Age. Paleo means old. And these are going to be the time of the first stone tools. This is going to be very early in, in human history, right? The Paleolithic. And the stone tools will be quite simple. Then in the middle, you have the Mesolithic, meso meaning middle, the Middle Stone Age. And then, which brings us to the Neolithic, the New Stone Age. Notice I didn't give you guys dates on that. These time periods are largely defined by what happens in them, the stone tool technology in them. So the, the dates vary a lot depending on where in the world you are, how you're defining it, and so on. But if we do want to worry about dates, what I would say is for the Neolithic, the date of like 8000 BC, that's really early, right? That's right at the early edge of the Neolithic. So Gobekli Tepe is in very early days of the Neolithic. But in terms of the technology, in terms of what they're doing, it's very Neolithic in cultural style, if that makes sense. It's very complex. So we again are focusing on the culture more than the date now the neolithic is also known for the neolithic revolution right i think many of us have heard that before and it's such a bummer i actually hate this name the neolithic revolution because you're like new stone revolution and it has nothing to do with stone tools really that's farming the neolithic revolution equals farming or animal domestication, right? This kind of stuff. But it's largely this idea of farming. Also, what comes with the Neolithic Revolution is the idea of settled villages. You'll hear settled village life, right? So this is the idea that at this time during the Neolithic, that early humans finally settled down and started farming. Now, the classic chicken egg argument in archaeology is which came first the village or the farming and the short answer is who knows and it depends you know and does it really matter because they both sort of work together right so once you're choosing one you kind of naturally go for the other and vice versa so what we have here with gobekli tepe is a site that straddles the world between a hunter-gatherer landscape, a hunter-gatherer ideology, and a settled farming ideology. And I love sites like this. It's the opposite of what you would think an archaeologist would say. And I'm sure that most archaeologists would agree with me because it's so fascinating, right? It's right on that ragged edge. It also shows us that a very simple model of human history is not enough. There's a lot of other variation here. And again, we've known this for decades, but the oversimplified idea that hunters and gatherers just cruised around the landscape. And then one weekend they were like, Hey, this farming thing looks pretty good. And they just put their hunting tools aside and then built some huts to live in and started a village, right? That's not reasonable. There has to be in between situations, situations where people still do a lot of hunting and where hunting informs how they get food week by week and month by month. But they're also starting to do more intensive farming techniques. If you think of farming, of course, that's not going to happen overnight. There has to be in betweens. And so with this setup of this early Neolithic place of Gobekli Tepe, I think what you're really seeing is a place where they are still hunting and gathering, but they're also practicing, practicing what I like to call horticulture, right? You can call it early agriculture if you really want, but what's happening is they are finding staple food crops and kind of planting them nearby. They're planting other crops nearby. I like to think of horticulture as the art and science of gardening. You're not growing fields of wheat yet, but you're starting this farming thing. You're growing what you like. You're going to start growing stuff that's maybe hard to find, you know, you don't where you don't want to 
traipse out into the natural world for hours and hours to try and find a certain plant, you grow it next to your house or next to your settlement where you are staying, right? It all, it all makes sense. It all kind of goes together. So we're looking at this kind of very interesting in between time. Now, this brings us to the structure of Gobekli Tepe itself. How did these people make something like this? Of course, it was made communally, right? This is a big stones like this to move that stuff. It needed a lot of cooperation. And, you know, was this a society that had a leader or something like that? I would think so. But this is, of course, not a state level society. So this is some sort of village life, you know, that, uh, of that level of society, if that makes sense, of that level of complexity with some sort of central organization where maybe a, a central family member, elder or this kind of thing could get other families and other groups together in order to work together and make this thing. In terms of what these circular enclosures actually are, what do they symbolize? What do they mean? Welcome to the hard part of archaeology. Right. And I am not here to tell you that I know precisely what these are or what they mean. And I, I can give you educated guesses, but you may be wondering at this point why I even bring up Gobekli Tepe for the pseudo archaeology podcast, because so far it's been like, hey, Kinkala, we've really talked about Gobekli Tepe as a cool archaeology site. This is where <laughs> my reasoning comes in, because you have pseudo-archaeologists who interpret this completely incorrectly and use it to try and prove silly and foolish ideas. So we don't want to lose sight of the fact that this is an amazing structure made by an early Neolithic group, made communally. And I think this area of Gobekli Tepe would have been their communal structures that would have been used for both ritual purposes and domestic purposes. What I mean is at certain times these would have been used for like religious rituals and this kind of thing. But at other times they would have been used for secular things, everyday things like think of a gymnasium at a school or something like that. A gymnasium could be used for church services, you know, but a gymnasium can also be used to play a basketball game in. The structure itself can be repurposed for different activities may they be more ritual or may they be more secular and this is my guess on this now it is very difficult this is a toughie man and this is also where it reminds me of stonehenge a little bit like you, you know you you can't say for sure and the structure itself is so interesting you want to but you got to be scientific about it i will also say that that based on the structure itself it really looks like it was built over generations so gobekli tepe was built over a very long time this is not something they put up in 10 years you know this was built slowly over time added on to you have these different circular enclosures again i believe there's six and you know, they started with one they do another one and it continues over a very long time now as i've set this up for you this place in the early neolithic the change, the, the in-between between hunter-gathering and a settled village life. Does Gobekli Tepe fit into modern archaeology? Yes, totally. And it's great. And we love Gobekli Tepe. It's such an interesting site that shows this mixture. And what I find fascinating about so many places in the world is you see this kind of thing, versions of it, actually quite a bit. And what I mean by that is there are so many different ways that human beings live across the earth, so many different choices that they make that you will find moments where hunting and gathering, the cliche of hunting and gathering and the cliche of farming kind of come together where cultures do both. And they do it over time because it's a good choice because both work together. Why stop one for the other if you're still getting food from both of them? You know, so you see it culturally a lot, but in terms of a, a very simple models about talking about the ancient past, it feels like they don't fit in. It feels like everything needs to go either in the hunter gatherer box or the village life with farming box. 
And it's not like that. There's multiple boxes with different percentages of this in each. So that's what makes this site so great, right? And it's old. This is, you know, 10,000 years old, even 11 and a half thousand. That's pretty good for something like this. I Man, I just can't get over it. I, I, I just dig this site. I, I hate myself because I actually don't teach it in my intro to archaeology class. Now, intro to archaeology, I really have to pick and choose because it goes by fast and I have to hit all kinds of highs. But for the last couple of years, I've been like, how can I wiggle Gobekli Tepe in there? I, I promise you, world, that one of these days I will. With that said, when we come back, how Gobekli Tepe relates to the pseudo-archaeology crowd. Hello and welcome back to the Pseudo-Archaeology Podcast, episode 113. I am still your host, Dr. Andrew Kinkella, and we have been discussing Gobekli Tepe. Now, we want to remember that some of the symbolism on the cross beams, on the, on the large megaliths, right, the large stones... Is pretty cool. I, I touched on it before, but these anthropomorphic figures, and it's not just like vultures and scorpions. They also have like snakes on there, spiders, lions, this kind of stuff. It's really dynamic, the iconography on these huge stones. What does that iconography mean? I can't tell you. And this is something that haunts us in archaeology when we look at stuff like rock art, right? And carvings like this. We can tell you what creatures they are. That's great. We can look at it and go like, that's a spider. And in fact, it's an anthropomorphic spider. Again, that it's, it's sort of humanish. But in terms of, you know, why they're there, what do they symbolize? Do they symbolize different clans? Do they symbolize uh, different religious creatures, mythological beasts, you know, this kind of thing? Man, we just can't say, but there is for sure symbolism there. You know, it's dynamic and it's interesting. Now, with stuff like that and with archaeologists being honest, saying you can't tell 100 percent, you know, we can tell this is ritual, but you know, we can't say the specifics. Of course, it's a perfect time for the pseudo archaeology crowd to step in and tell you what it means. Right. Based on nothing. So, of course, oh, if you've enjoyed, as I have, Ancient Apocalypse, Ancient Apocalypse ruins Gobekli Tepe, just like it ruins everything else it touches. So, according to Graham Hancock, oh, why do I bring us down like this, you guys? Why do I do it? Everything was so great. We were talking about the Neolithic and all its fantasticness. And now... Back into the mud we go. So according to Graham Hancock, this site, because it dates to like, you know, between 10 and 11 and a half thousand years ago, it's too complex for the people of that time to have made it. He says that it must have been made by survivors from the advanced civilization at the end of the Ice Age, right? How many times has he beat this drum? This horse is dead. Stop beating it. You know, that this idea that there's this super complex civilization and they are wiped out at the end of the Ice Age, right? And again, you guys, I have to say this. There is no evidence for that. Zero, not a piece, not assured, not a fragment. Not, not a stone tool, nothing from a, a pre end of Ice Age advanced civilization. But according to him, you, you can, you've heard this story so many times that the people there couldn't have done it. You know, he says, according to us, according to archaeologists, that these people were unsophisticated hunters and gatherers who lived in mud huts. I've just gotten through telling you the exact opposite. Right. But that's how grandma, he's got to set it up. So archaeologists tell you that these people were just simpletons. But in fact, what's funny is Graham Hancock goes with that extremely short sighted and wrong view. He actually says, yeah, they were like simpletons. They needed these magical people who survived the end of the Ice Age to show them the secrets of how to build things out of stone, I guess, and how to how to carve vultures. 
you couldn't just carve a vulture on your own. You had to have a magic alien person tell you how to do it, you know? So it's just silly. The the overdone, I, I'm telling you, this couldn't have existed. It, and he says it's a reboot of this past civilization. And I'm like, no, dude, this is an initial boot. Okay. This is a 1.0, not a 2.0, not a 2.5. 1.0. And to destroy your day a little bit further, Graham Hancock also connects it to the comet theory, right? The idea that the comet, you know, hit the Earth and made the Earth flood at the end of the Ice Age, right? You you know this story. And it's, I guess, Gobekli Tepe is able to arise out of the leftover ashes of the, the comet and the flood that came from that. So coming with symbolism on it that mortal man of the time couldn't have possibly come up with because, you know, a lion, that's a step too far. But you see, when when we have to deal with a story that foolish, doesn't it again, doesn't it just bring everything down? Don't you feel that? You're like, man, we're having this great ride, you know, about the this dynamic early Neolithic little ritual maybe communal structure we're not quite sure and part of the being not quite sure is part of the greatness of it you know Ooh, the, but you know what later in the next 10 years 20 years we're going to figure out a little more and th- there actually still is a lot of excavations to still be done in that area it's still a dynamic site you know they're still doing stuff there so the next while has such cool stuff that's going to come i am very much looking forward to what they're going to find at Gobekli Tepe. It's the exact opposite of this old, tired, foolish, dumb story about the end of the last ice age. What? You know, it's just, it's just, oh, it just, it's like smog. It just clouds the air and it's just gross to breathe. You know, I want smog free archaeology. Don't you? Where we can enjoy this dynamic, amazing sight from 10,000 years ago. And with that, I'll see you guys next time. Thanks for listening to the pseudo archaeology podcast. Please like and subscribe wherever you like and subscribe. And if you have questions for me, Dr. Andrew Kinkella, feel free to reach out using the links below or go to my YouTube channel. Kinkella teaches archaeology. See you guys next time. This episode was produced by Chris Webster from his RV traveling the United States, Tristan Boyle in Scotland, DigTech LLC, Cultural Media, and the Archaeology Podcast Network, and was edited by Chris Webster. This has been a presentation of the Archaeology Podcast Network. Visit us on the web for show notes and other podcasts at www.archpodnet.com. Contact us at chris at archaeologypodcastnetwork.com.